But then you don't have the surprise, right? If you have the misleader. I don't know. It's pretty surprising if somebody said, "What can I order a drink?" Punch me in the face. That is a surprising and unusual thing to say. It It just doesn't fit with the formula, and I think people are tired of formulas. Welcome to the podcast, Jay. Thank you. It's very wonderful to be here. You know, I know a lot of my guests and I don't know you well, which makes you a very interesting puzzle for today. I'm fascinating to everyone. (laughs) I bet. Those who who know me and uh, those who don't. I'm a riddle wrapped in an enigma. (laughs) Okay, let's unwrap it. Okay. And uh, so first of all, um, we do have six degrees of separation. You developed and wrote for five years on The Simpsons. Yes. And during part of that time, I was a model for the animators on the show. So I would show up, you know, on a weeknight. And Paul Wee organized this, right? Mm -hmm. And Mark Kirkland, you know these guys? I do do know. I know Mark very well. (laughs) Yes. And they were there. And we never met. Okay. Well, there you go. So, so like when they would say, hey, please hold this coffee cup and look mad. That was you? No, I was creatures and I oh. was living out scenes and- But I'm never, saying like, was it a specific would, thing they were trying to draw or they're filming you do stuff and then they were going to match the film? What was it? How did that work? They were never telling me what to do. Okay. It was for practice, for fun. It was, I think, something that most animation companies hire models for. So I work for DreamWorks, Disney, all the video game companies, lots of TV shows. And so I came to the Simpsons. Simpsons, So I saw you as you move buildings. And it's just so weird. I guess you're not an artist. Did you not go and draw? No, no. Uh, I'm a terrible drawer. The only thing I ever drew was one thing on the show. Uh, and a very rough version of Kang and Kodos, uh, aliens that, because the stage directions were kind of difficult for people to understand. So they said that was, it was basically an octo, one eyed octopus with fangs in an old fashioned diver, diver's helmet. And they said, what, what are you talking about? And so I drew on a little piece of paper what I thought that looked like. And Kang and Kodos looked 80% what that drawing was. Wow. Yeah, that's exciting. Yeah, that's exciting. So that's uh, my, but I, but that's that is to tell you that I'm not an artist. I'm uh, at all. Okay, you are a creator. You do. I'm a writer. I'm a writer and a writer. You're a writer. writer. Okay, I'm a writer. Say it, what it writer is. producer. Yeah. Writer producer. Okay, and you've worked on so many television shows, like epic shows, Frasier, Malcolm in the Middle, Everybody Loves Raymond, George Lopez Show. Um, I'm sure there are people whose ears are perking up right now with recognition of all those shows. Uh, What got you into this crazy business? Well, what got me into show business is being adjacent to show business. So my father is a television writer, producer, and I got to go to work and watch him work. And I liked his work and I liked the, it seemed fun to make TV shows. Writing did not seem fun, but working on TV shows seemed a lot of fun. So I decided someday I'm going to work on TV shows. And I tried to be, I was a kid actor. I was an ah. actor on a bunch of shows as a kid. And I was a, a stand-up comedian when I was younger. I was listening to the Groundlings, an improv performance show place. And uh, I tried to be a performer of some kind. Didn't get a ton of traction as, uh, doing that. I was a PA on a lot of shows. And then eventually fell into writing as a last resort. Uh, my partner and I were working as a PA is on It's Gary Shandling Show, which is a Showtime show. And we tried to write an episode and we handed it to them and they said, uh, this is a good sample. We, we're not going to use it, but maybe we'll give you a shot at writing something else. They never did, but we knew another sample. And we showed that to a guy named Sam Simon, who was working over at the Tracy Ullman Show. And they, he showed it to his boss, Jim Brooks and Heidi Perlman and, and uh, I guess uh, uh, Jerry Belson and Ken Eston. And they read it and they said, this is just good enough to let them talk to us. So we <laughs> we we got an interview and we pitched a sketch. They let us write the sketch. Then they hired us to be on the show at the lowest possible level, and we got very lucky. You that sure started did. a writing career that's been lasted now for uh, thirty five years. Very impressive. Yeah. Extremely impressive. And I still um, never wanted to be a writer, and I still don't. I would much rather be anything else—an actor, a director, anything else. Why not? Act. I mean, you must have opportunities. I don't have much op- many opportunities. Uh, 
when I do, when people, a friend of mine called me the other day, I said, would you do this part? I said, yes. So anytime somebody calls me, I will do anything. I don't really have a ton of time to audition. And uh, a friend of mine, I'm actually here and uh, working on a, on, on a personal project with a friend of mine who is a director named John Turtletaub. And he put me in uh, a movie at the beginning of a ride at Disneyland. Soaring over California, soaring mm -hmm. over the, and I, I said, yes. And that's been playing there for 20 years. And I got a lot of recognition for that. So I'll do anything anybody puts me in. I won't put myself in anything because okay. that's taking a job away from an actor. I already have a job. If I'm putting myself in something, I already have a job. That's very so honorable. If I can uh, give an actor a job, then I will do that. That's very honorable. Uh, so you're really one of us. The people, a lot of the people listening today are actors. Yes. And so it's good to know that you're one of us and that, you know, being a PA can lead to something. I was a PA. I did get my SAG card that way. And, but it was, it was a nightmare. Like I got all the, the scripts. Oh, look at that SAG after. That's my SAG card. I am so proud. I, I thought being a PA was really hard. I'm glad that it turned into something for you. I got my SAG card through being a PA. So that was the most beautiful thing. Um, how do you write funny? Where does that come from? <laughs> well, you don't write funny. I uh, We don't write funny. What you do is you write scenes with characters. So you commit to the characters. And then when, you, when the situation has uh, conflict, and or the situation's heightened or unusual, oftentimes it can come out very dramatic or very funny. It's just a choice. So you, as a writer, can pick a tone and the tone you choose is how you decide whether it's going to be funny or not. But I don't set out to say, oh, here's a joke I want to put in anything. I never do that. I say, here's a situation. There's, and you could put any situation, make it any situation, could be a drama or a comedy. Uh, doesn't matter what it is. A guy's getting open heart surgery uh, and it's a life and death situation. He's saying goodbye to his wife. He may not make it. That scene could be really sad or that scene could be super funny, depending upon what he's saying. Like if he's talking about minutia of his life, about, you know, where the keys are and the little details about, you know, the vacuum doesn't work unless you press it twice, that kind of stuff. Then the details make it what's funny or, or the details make it what's sad. Hmm. I love that you say that because I teach actors, a lot of actors, and always trying to find the real situation that it's that that they don't get to laugh at themselves. It's the situation that's a real human life situation. So when you're crafting a script, then you're looking at things that an actor would look at, like always. What's, I'm looking. What's the human need? The human action? What's the situation? And well, then we, we say, uh, writers say, what's the drive? What's the character drive? What is the character? What is it? What does this character want? What journey are they on? And how can we take them on that journey? But that's the same stuff. You know, in, e in every scene, the actor, as was an, I as an actor say, what is my what does my character want? As a writer, I'm saying, what is the, what's happening in the story that's progressing the story? And often it's I'm dealing with all the actors, all the all the characters and figuring out what's going to happen, what's going to what. What obstacles are in the way of the character's drive and how can we try to resolve it? And what what sets the next scene in motion and where are we going at the end? All those are, are, are fine. I don't try to make, I don't make actor sense of every scene I write. And you can tell that when you read a script, sometimes the writer did not think completely through what the actor was going to do. They just had a goal to get to the end of the scene with something specifically happening because that line wouldn't make sense for somebody who is that upset. They wouldn't say that line. Or conversely, that's, you know, this person's having a great day in this particular scene. Why is why do they why does this line come out of the blue? Right? That's because the writer's not thinking like an actor. The writer's just thinking like a writer, saying, Well, I I like this controversial moment. And the actor will find a way to get there. Mm. We trust the actors to find a way to get there. Also, the thing that I like about what you're saying and the thing about a writer is. In our minds, the actors in our scene are totally committing to that scene. The, the characters are totally committing. That's an easy thing to say and a hard thing to do with real flesh and blood actors. But that's what's happening Why? in our mind. Why is it hard? Because, Well, for example, we'll write uh, the character brings in a tray of uh, champagne and suddenly trips over... Uh, 
trips over something and the tray of champagne falls and he gets up and says something funny. Well, you can't trip over a tray of champagne and get up and say something funny like that. In real life, you fall, champagne falls, there's a second clanking, smashing, and then a line. And a writer doesn't think that way because a writer can think it just happens cartoon fast. But in real life, it has to take time. So that's why we don't we don't play out the scene physically the way actors have to. And so mm -hmm. it, it, it's just a, it's slightly different. And also right. uh, we hear things, we hear readings in our head of what the actor should sound like. And real life actors don't always sound that way. They have to sound the way they sound. They have to go through their uh, process and their craft and it comes out differently. And a good writer producer will listen to what the actor is doing and say, I appreciate that and thank you. And if it's not hitting right, they'll adjust what they're doing instead of trying to force them to do it the way they originally heard it in their head. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm sure you've come into the contact with, with writers who say, that's not how you say it. You should say it this way. And that's, of course, the terrible thing to say. Fortunately, I haven't. Okay, uh, that's good. I yeah, I did study um, sitcom directing with uh, two directors, Mary Lou Belli and Phil Ramuno. Do you know either of them? I don't know either of them, but I'm also a okay. sitcom director. So okay, I've done that so they wrote a book called Faster, Funnier, Louder, and I've had here's them my, both here's on my Here's my DGA pod. card. Oh, you are blowing me away. I want one of those. Um, you, you know, and so I did study. I specifically went to study rhythm. Comedy comes in threes, the turn, the misleads. And I don't think... That one doesn't come in threes. I just not always. Okay, yeah. okay. Comedy but comes in ones. You don't need you don't need a setup, a reinforcement of setup, and a reverse to make something funny. That that formula is you could just do the something funny. You don't need the setup and the something funny. You know what? What will I have? What what will uh, I have to drink? Well, I'll have a uh, a Coca Cola. Uh, we don't have Coca-Cola. Are you sure I can't get a Coca-Cola? I'm sorry, we don't have a Coca-Cola. Well, then I'll have a punch in the face or something like that. That's that. <laughs> you can just, what do you have to drink? I'll have a punch in the face. It's equally as funny or not funny in that particular case. What I'm saying is not, but it's equally unfunny to say it just the first thing coming out of the, you know, your mouth. Yes. If, I get you don't that. need three. But then That's you don't all. have the surprise, right? If you have the misleader. I don't turn. know. It's pretty surprising if somebody said, what can I order a drink? Punch me in the face. That yeah. is a surprising and unusual thing to say. It, it just is. doesn't fit with the formula. And I think people are tired of formulas. So I would uh, be against doing the formula. Okay. People are tired of it. Okay. We've seen so, it. We expect it. Right. So would you say that we're losing some of that Catskill humor? Oh. Like the, the yes, origins? Of yes. Comedy? I think we're losing not just Catskill humor, but we're all, you know, humor evolves and changes. There's a, there's a real thing that happens in TV now. I don't know if you studied like um, the Chuck Lorre sitcoms like uh, uh, mm -hmm. Big Bang Theory or something like that. Sure. Which, where in the sitcoms when I grew up, they had beginnings, middles, and ends. It began and a thing, and then there's a resolve at the end where the, something especially funny happens. And the, we all got expe expected now beginning, middle, and end. And as an audience member, we say, oh, we see where this is going. So-and-so's getting fired. Well, they're not really going to get fired because it's their job on the show. So they're going to get fired and something's going to happen. And then they're going to get back to the show at the end. And let's watch that. But now Chuck Lorre doesn't do endings. He just mm -hmm. does a scene that leads to another scene that leads to another scene that leads to another scene and the show is over. So the audience that's trying to track a story and sort of guess what the ending is can't do it because there is no ending. Uh, and and does, I think that's does that that's keep a, them coming back for more? I mean, what yes, because okay. they if they like the characters, they think the characters are funny, and they just want to watch the characters interacting with certain scenes and certain. There's still controversy. There's still conflict. There's still a problem that's going on. It's just not not necessarily resolved. You and know, is, ev is everyone going to do it because Chuck Lorre's doing it? Uh, well, he's not the only one that does it, but, uh, okay. I think, I think people are trying to find ways to do things that aren't so tidy and so re resolved. I mean, I watched Abbott Elementary and they have beginnings, middles and ends. You can, they have ends that come up. So it's not everybody's doing it, but, uh, and it's a very successful show, but they have other things to make it fresher. You know, they're dealing with uh, school and, and, uh, in a different way and, and a little sharper. So as long as you're keeping it fresh in some way, then it's good. 
Okay, fresh is good. Fresh is always fresh good. Fresh is good. And I mean, we're all, the reason why TV is kind of dying <laughs> is that people are used to it, tired of it, and, you know, they don't want to devote the time to a lot of it. At least kids, do, people of a certain age. So you have to keep it new and sharp and interesting to get people's attention. Okay. Okay. And that's, that's our job. That's our job as actors then too. Yeah, for sure. Yes. And we have to adjust to the style. Uh, are you a teacher as well? I thought I read that you, you, you teach at USC. I do. I teach screenwriting and television writing at USC. I've taught, uh, you know, other courses in, in acting and writing and other things. So yeah. Phenomenal. High five. To and I'm also a baseball coach sometimes. And a baseball coach. You have kids? Young kids? I, I do. I have a son. But okay. I mean, I haven't met a baseball coach in about 10 years. <laughs> so, so, <laughs> brain of salt. Okay, good, 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 good. Um, so, wow, we have to talk about the strike because I see you are out on the picket lines. Of course, now we're out on the picket lines with you. I was out before. Uh, you're out a lot right now. Could we talk about the Writers Guild strike and the SAG strike? And how do you feel yeah. having us out there with you now? How has that changed the mood of the picket lines? Well, it's great. Uh, you know, it's great to have people out there, a new energy. People, it's day 80 something for us, 83 or something for us. It's it's day six or seven or eight for you guys. So you guys have energy and you're excited, and that's great. It's nice to have uh People who are unashamed of their bodies on the, the picket line. It's all writers who seem to be ashamed of their bodies. Posture is like low. We, you know, the the guys are muscled and walking in tight t shirts, and the girls are very, you know, chest out walking around. So they're 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 very proud of themselves and their bodies. Whereas writers are just like hiding. Um, uh, great energy. They're they're cheering on the lines. Writers are tired, and we're just walking quietly. You know, it's mm -hmm. it's a whole other thing. It's good to have company. It's important to march on the picket lines for a lot of reasons. The reasons are, that, you know, one is it creates unity among those who are striking. You don't feel so alone. Mm -hmm. uh, it shows the people, uh, the companies that we're still out there. We still have energy and we're still united. So there's no, we're not flagging. They can't depend on us to sort of fall apart anytime right. soon. Also, the other industry people that we're putting out of work, like the cameramen and sound people, and thing, you know, they should know that we're sweating in the sun. We right. don't take them for granted. We don't want, we don't think this is easy on anybody and it shouldn't be easy on us. No, no, I I, I feel for you. Um, I was out with the writers and I heard some people talking like, oh, when the actors come, it's going to be so obnoxious. There's going to be musical theater and singing. And it was the funniest conversation that I overheard. Um, I'm thinking about- and what there Is was musical theater <laughs> and singing. They're a hundred percent right, but it was fun. It's fun to have them, and it's fun to see my actor friends online. And a lot of my actor friends were on the line even before, even before the strike, mm -hmm. uh, even before the SAG strike. They were out there with us, and uh, I appreciate that. Yes, it's a it's a long time for you guys. Um, what what can you do creatively during this time? Well, I'm working on things. I'm just not working on things that I'm going to sell to anybody until the strike's over. But I'm working on things. I'm, I'm here. In, I'm actually in a hotel room in Las Vegas uh, celebrating my friend's birthday. And also, uh, we're working on an idea uh, for a movie that we might someday write together and then try to sell. But nothing nothing stops us from doing that. The only thing that we're stopped from doing is working for the companies that won't sign a deal. We can generate material and projects, you know, uh, but just not show it to anybody until there's a, a, a deal. So you must have a lot of friends that are on that other side working for those companies because these are people you've worked with for years pitching projects. Um, any sense of, you know, are you able to communicate with them? Are some of them siding with you secretly? Is there like, what happens to those relationships? Those relationships are fine. Uh, my, my executive friends, are still friends. They're not the people we're negotiating with. We're negotiating with uh, larger forces, giant corporate forces, Silicon Valley forces that my friends are at the mercy of, just like I am. When they make their deal, you know, they're they're at the mercy of giant corporations, and their usefulness is only as useful as they are today to those companies. They know that, uh, but. They're also not on the inside track of negotiations. Nobody in that room is except the, the people who are at the very, very top echelon of all those companies and their business affairs people. And the 
AMPTP. So it's a very select group of people who know what's going on. Are those people going to lose their jobs? Well, Which those ones? People, the people that are the executives. The creative are, executives and stuff? Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, yes, eventually. Because <laughs> they're not I mean, doing anything, right? I mean, yeah, but they're not going to. They the, the corporation, these people, these movie companies and TV, they want to make products. And they're going to need those people. So, so just getting rid of them and hiring new people makes no sense. Mm -hmm. um, they're going to lose billions of dollars unless they kind of come together with us to make some kind of deal that makes sense. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it won't be the deal that we're happy with and it won't be the deal that they're happy with, but it'll be a deal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And do you see that happening before the end of the year? Yeah, I I think it does. I I I thought it would take 120 days for uh, them to start negotiating with us, which means that sometime in August or September they'll start negotiating. Mm -hmm. I think they can make a deal, hopefully around then. Or if they can't, then it will go into 2024, and that'll be real pain. I mean, yeah. real. People are on the edge of losing homes. People are on the edge of of uh, you know companies are on the edge of of losing lots of subscribers. I mean, there's lots of pain on both sides that people are starting to feel right now. Um, so hopefully something can be done. But I think I have, it only makes sense that they're going to make a deal. Mm -hmm. They came in with an expectation to make, give us only this much. And we are saying reconfigure the whole thing. Realign the whole payment structure to the world which you're giving us now, which has to do with, streaming and not TV, not broadcast residuals. Like the whole idea of broadcast residuals is yesterday's news. So let's think of a new way to sort of get people to some workable solution and hopefully uh, some accommodations will be made. I hope so. I, hope I think so they too. will be because I mean, the, these a lot of these companies like Viacom, which owns CBS and Paramount Plus, they need product. They need stuff for their fall season. NBC, Comcast needs stuff. Disney, despite what Bob, Bob, Bob Iger says, if he's still in the TV business, if he hasn't sold it off, he's still going to need product for mm -hmm. ABC and uh, and Fox, which are two of his TV. He doesn't own Fox Broadcasting, I think. Still, Murdoch still do. But anyway, they all need product, product. And, and, and it has to come. Or they're going to lose a lot of money and they're going to lose viewers and they're going to lose. That may be happening anyway, but it's going to exacerbate, exacerbate mm -hmm. that. And we don't want mm -hmm. to exacerbate that. We want to keep as many TV and movie viewers as we can. Uh, question for you. How do you discover new actors? And um, how? where do you scout talent? Or do you rely on your casting directors? I rely on my casting directors. I, You know, every now and then I'll say to my, if I'm on a show, like, oh, have you seen that movie with this person in it? Or have you seen that TV show with this person in it? Um, almost never do I go to... Uh, you know, the sort of casting call, the thing where they're, uh, where actors are being presenting Show scenes, showcases, showcases exactly. Mm -hmm. Showcases. I never, I, I never, very rarely do I go to this. Sometimes I'll go to ones if the network I'm working for says, this is for this network, you know, CBS is having a actor showcase or, you know, so please come to that. I will do that. But otherwise, I'm not going. And uh, so, the, so the casting comes from me knowing people and wanting to work with people uh, we, or my casting director having some ideas or we send out the breakdown and then we wait for uh, the, the people to submissions. And then mm -hmm. the, you know, I generally, if I'm a, a producer on a TV show, I don't see the first submissions. I see the casting director has called through them and then given me their best take on mm -hmm. on people and then we it's so it's so hard for actors there's like i teach so many talented actors that are not even in that system they don't even know how to get in that system right and so and and they're ridiculously talented right do you, so i mean even my relationship with you i found you on facebook we were friends i'm not mm -hmm. sure how i know we know mutual people but are you responsive to people like myself who reach out to you on social media? Yeah, that's why I'm doing this. <laughs> you know, it's okay. like, yeah, Great. I, I mean, I do, I do, uh, I talk to people all the time. I actually, 
I talk to writing hopefuls. I talk to acting hopefuls. I go to, uh, I do whatever I can in that regard. I'm available on Twitter and Facebook and uh, Instagram, but I have a, every Friday I have a show called Philosophy Friday on Twitter where we discuss some philosophical thing that happens usually around four to five o'clock on a Friday. And I talk with people but I, uh, about a philosophical subject, but I also talk with them about writing or I talk with them about show business or acting or other things. Any kind of question that they have, I will answer once a week at, on Jay Hogan's Philosophy Friday. But That is fabulous. But okay. I also, I'm receptive to people if I can. A lot of people want me to read stuff. I can't always read stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, writing submissions. I can't always see you know, if you have a great movie that you did, I don't have time to watch the whole movie. Um, and if you sent me a great clip of yourself doing something, there's a really good likelihood I will forget you by the time I actually casting something, which is mm. sad but true. Like if I, we have a, a great conversation and I know this person, I think they're the great actor. I'm not the person, I don't have a bank of actors that I met who are wonderful who I have to work with. Do you have I a style? Do you have a style of actor like the Cohen brothers have their style? Do you have a particular style of people that make you laugh? A certain persona, well, what, character. What, what, I mean, they have a style of of directing, but what's the style of actor? What Stephen Root works with the Cohen brothers a lot. He's done a million different great things. I don't know what kind of style of an actor he is. Well, I mean, if you look at the greats like Godar and, you know, they all had their their crop of Baz Luhrmann. They all have their crop of people they like. Are you do you have your crop? But I don't know that those the particular actors have a specific style. John Goodman for the Coen brothers, John Goodman or, or Stephen Root or, you know, George Clooney. Uh, if what is I, I don't know if I'm smart enough to know that's the style. I know they're great actors. Stephen yeah, Root mean, is one of my favorite actors. Okay, George Clooney is so pretty, pretty. Yeah, it's pretty much like George Clooney in every role, and I love him because he's George Clooney. I, yeah, I mean, I have. I mean, but he, he's the American in the American. He was a different per person. I mean, I love him, but he's yeah. he's he looks like George, Clooney, but but he can be he can be different people. In Hail to the Conquering Hero, or the, the Coen Brothers movie, he was love a much more that. vapid, silly. You know. Yes, yes, you're right. You know, you're so right, of he course. he's a good actor, and 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 and. Uh, so I, I guess I don't subscribe to the idea that there are style of actors. I just think there are good actors and not good actors. And mm -hmm. and the good actors who commit, they commit to the moment. They commit to the idea of the moment. Uh, that's how they make you believe. Uh, I don't need the actor to be drunk to play drunk. I don't need the actor to be a psycho to, to play a psycho. Right, 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 uh, right. But I need them in that moment to commit. Yes, That's what it's I all about commitment. In comedy, in comedy, in the groundlings, in everything, it's about committing to the scene, committing to the moment, and being in that moment. And that's also about writing, too, committing to the scene and being in the moment. So I like actors who, who, who commit and aren't afraid to commit. Great. I love to hear that because I'm teaching the same thing. Art Great. is in the choice. And that's what Lee Strasberg said. And I teach at his school, the Strasberg yep. Institute. And so that that's huge. That's huge that you have to be brave and you have to follow through. And then um, and if things need to be tweaked or changed, that that will come. But come with an idea, come with a, a, a you know, come with a thought about what it is, you know, come with your secret animal or whatever else you're gonna do. That's okay too. But but be, be, be that character, be consistent and be there all the time. That, that is a pleasure. And when somebody is really committed, they make the words, you know, can I get you something? You know, I'm aware, can I get you something brilliant? Like it doesn't have to be, I as a writer don't have to write all that much because the actor is doing so much of the work being real. Mm -hmm. Being real, being human. You, you've won four Emmys, you know, you really, you have some solid grand, ground to stand on. You've given us some wonderful advice today. Is there anything else that you feel my audience should know, should listen to? It's a hard business. We're in hard times right now. And yet I can tell like myself that you love what you do. I do. I mean, that's the thing. Pursue it because you love it. Pursue it because you have passion. It's fun. It's a fun world. If you can make a living at it, oh my gosh, that's so great. And if you can't make a living at it and you still want to do it, keep on doing it. You know, it's 
that's that's the joy of it. So I, I don't really have this. The world is changing. Our business is changing. Everything's changing. And so if you stick around for a few years, we'll see where everything lands and you might have a better shot at figuring out how to get through uh, while things condense. But but uh, it's still a fun job. It's been a great life for me as a writer and uh, as a failed actor. It's been a great life for me still uh, and as a failed comedian. So uh, I wouldn't trade it for anything. I'm so happy to hear that. And, you know, maybe after the strike, things will, like you said, will be better for everyone. There'll be less corporate greed. There'll be more opportunities oh. for everyone. Don't and count we on less corporate greed. Do not count what? on that. I am counting on it. I'm counting on a trickle down effect from our strike into other industries. It's got oh, this has, it, has to be labor, an awakening. There is a labor fight that's coming that's huge. It's nobody's going to give us a, an inch. We're going to have to fight for it. It's not going to okay. be trickle down. It's going to be like time to fight. But I mean, like when I say trickle down effect, I mean other industries that they're going to stand up. They're going to strike. They're going to yeah, fight. It's going to we are. It's going to spread. I would say it's spreading. Uh, yeah, the idea is spreading. And so I, 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 I was fighting with the UPS workers on Wednesday. I was fighting with the hotel workers on Friday. So it's not just writers. It's everybody trying to reclaim a little bit more of the inequitable pie that's going on. Mm -hmm. I appreciate you saying that. I, I feel the same way. I feel very optimistic. Okay, so so Jay, uh, we're going to find you on social media. Really easy to find Jay. His last name is K-O-G-E-N. And yes. um, My, every, I'm at J-A-Y-K-O-G-E-N at whatever it is, Twitter, at Instagram, at Facebook, at, uh, you know, any anything, J-A-Y-K-O-G-E-N. And I will, you know, generally speaking, be able to chat with you uh, on social media. And that's fine. Okay. And, uh, I think, I think you're funny. I think like we'd want to talk to you more. I think you're a funny guy and I can <laughs> well, see you. why, even though you try not to write funny, you can't help it because it's just your, it's your rhythm of life. And I yes. bet you've noticed that with other people in the industry, the, the greatest showrunners I know, they just have like something about them that makes them interesting. We, we definitely see life in an interesting way and we use humor when we can, because that's how we, you know, that's how we get people to like us. <laughs> so, so is that what it's all go. about? Maybe that's what it's all about at the end yes. of the day, right? Yes. Don't we? Don't we want to be? We want to be liked, or at least thought of as pleasant people. So we try to make people laugh, and people generally like that. <laughs> Thank you so much, Jay. I love Thank having you, you for on. Having me. Absolutely. I Enjoy really Vegas. Thanks, Jay. So fun talking to you. If you'd like to hear more of my other inspirational guests, be sure to go to my website, diaryofanactress.com. Until the next time, stay inspired. <laughs>